I think Andy has the ability to uh, be kind of a prankster and have a good sense of humor. If I were to describe Andy, I would describe him as silly, primarily. I think when he's at his happiest, he really likes to play jokes and tell jokes. That's so many! <laughs> what? <laughs> 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 oh, look at this. I think Andy is um, not your typical person with Down syndrome because of his secondary diagnosis of autism. Specifically, Down syndrome and autism spectrum disorder, or ASD for short. And that makes him not as social as typical children, people with Down syndrome are. They tend to be very socially outgoing and that tends to be one of their stronger suits. But Andy likes to be alone and he has repetitive behaviors from the autism. He likes to pull string through a tube or pop bubble wrap or sort coins. And he's very content to be alone and in his room and doing video games or watching movies on his iPad. And so um, I've struggled through the years with want, you know, imposing my dreams on Andy, having friends or being able to go out into the community and do activities and, and struggling with him being very content to just be alone or in his room. And so um, he's unique in, the, in that perspective and it's, it's been a challenge to struggle between what I would want for him and what he's quite happy doing. We had a couple things in Minnesota where we would have him over at our condo and that was always fun. I got him to play a new Star Wars game. He loved playing with our really, cats. Yeah, he liked our cats and he really liked my video games. And they yeah. were new video games and they were Star Wars. So I think I was in with Andy just because of the video <laughs> games right away. But hey, if that's what it takes, I'm, I'm happy about that. And then it, we, I ended up going to a park one day and picking up trash with him. He likes to use his grabber to pick mm -hmm. up trash. You wore your superhero Yeah, and I specifically shirts. wore my Batman shirt and he had a Spider-Man <laughs> shirt on because I'm just trying to connect. I was always, I've always been trying to connect with Andy. And mm. so that was one of my fond memories um, because it wasn't just sitting next to him at a dinner table and watching him leave. It was just me and him doing mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. And he, he did seem to enjoy it. If Bill and I were traveling, you and Megan would take him on the weekends and, you know, make sure he got to El Loro or whatever, that we had that routine. Well, then in 2017, when you and Megan decided to move to Wisconsin, I was devastated <laughs> because you were like my backup plan for Andy should something um, happen to Bill or I. And I just couldn't see what the future was going to hold for Andy because, um, you know, we'd waited nine years for the waiver to get him in that would pay for the group home and the day program. And I just, I just didn't know what the waiting would be if he, you know, was in Wisconsin. It was just a big question mark for us. And so um, in 2020, COVID happened and Bill and I decided to uh, take Andy out of the group home and have him come live with us to protect him from COVID. So he lived with us. And then in 2020, we got vaccinated and Andy got vaccinated and I started to look for a new group home and a new day program for him. And it was not going real well. So it was a big question mark. And then in June of 2020, you and Megan approached us and asked us if Andy could come live with you. I was a bit nervous, if I'm being honest. I was a bit nervous to have my brother live with me. While I do have fond memories of living with Andy growing up, I also have not so fond memories, and I was apprehensive about what my life would look like living with Andy in adulthood, and um, how he would be with my kids and how he would interact with my kids. I just, I didn't have a vision for what that looked like, and so that's why I was really appreciative of you, because I think you had a really strong vision of what our Andy would be like interacting with our family. And the, and the idea that you suggested to us is that you liked the way Megan turned out living and growing up with a person with a disability, and you wanted the same for your children, and that was just mind-blowing to me that uh, you had the perception to, uh, and that you wanted that for your children. And, and that was just an answer mm -hmm. to our prayers, mm -hmm. both in 
for, for what it would do with your family as well as what it would do for the Andy's care if something were to happen to us. He would be in a familiar situation. He wouldn't have to deal with lots of different variables, dealing with the death and the separation and a new group home and not having parents take him home on the weekend, that kind of thing. It was all just fell into place. It was mm -hmm. very gratifying. Yep. I did kind of had a, a, a bit of a idea of how I thought it might go down. And luckily it did go down that way, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it has not been a big burden to our family having, no, having him here. Not at all. Not even really that disruptive at all. Mm -hmm. And it could be. Right, it really could have been. And I was, I think, nervous for that. And it's been so smooth and so beneficial for everybody involved. Mm -hmm. And wow. now I've seen uh, him sitting on the couch holding hands with the, the, your children watching a movie and none of them being afraid of Andy or bothered by him, he'll play jokes on them, uh, feel very comfortable with your children and being integrated into this family. Um, that's what I see and, and I saw the beginnings of that happening uh, as we were leaving and I, with, along with Kathy, I was very confident that this was a good thing and a right thing to do. Why did you ultimately say yes? I mean, obviously there was a bit of a financial aspect. He has to pay us rent and stuff, mm -hmm. so. Well, ultimately I think I decided or realized that it is what's best for Andy. Andy living in a group home was not a great scenario. He was angry. He had a rotating door full of staff that was different every other month. and. It would be best for him to be independent from his parents, to be living with the family in Wisconsin with us. It would serve his independent nature a bit more. Um, and that's something you always told me about, that Andy wants to be independent. Yes. You've always said that about him. You've yes. picked up on that your whole life. Yes. He can, he can do things himself more than he'll let on. Um, and I think he likes that independence and that ownership of being able to accomplish certain tasks. And, and yeah, I feel like in, in many ways with, with your history of growing up with him and seeing some of that stuff, but also me being more of an introverted person where sometimes I wake up and I don't want to talk to anybody. I just feel a certain way and it kind of overwhelms me and I'm a normal person. You know, so that kind of gives me insight into what I think it would be like to be Andy all of the time. Mm -hmm. And so the combination of, of your, you know, experience with him and, and just who I am, I feel like we've really been able to unlock Andy's full potential. Yeah. And we figured it would take a transition when he moved here to integrate with your family. And in the past year, it's been shown to be where he's, he's not only integrated, but uh, become acclimated in, in a much quicker time. And, accomplished a whole lot more things in this last year than mm -hmm. he's ever done before. I was very nervous even when he moved here the first day that he was going to realize his parents were leaving, that he was staying here in a new state and a new right. house, and that he'd freak out and start yelling and crying and want to go back. I was very afraid of that moment. But actually the opposite happened. That's right. um, yeah, so I went into his room and I said, okay, Andy, y your parents are going to leave after lunch today and he said what about me and I said you're gonna stay here and he immediately got up and almost ran over to me mm -hmm. and just hugged me <laughs> he had done the same thing to me uh, when we were out at lunch um, that day with my parents and they were gonna leave for home and we were going to return back to our home in Wisconsin he had said the same thing. After this, mom and dad are going to go back to Minnesota to 8820. What about me? You're going to stay here with us at 520. And he just had this big smile on his face. They may also lack verbal communication. And this is often paired with little attempts at using other modes like signs, gestures, or eye gaze to intently communicate. Individuals with autism might show more interest in objects than in people. He often doesn't have eye contact, doesn't care to interact with people. You know, we have company and he just wants to go leave the room and go into his room, that kind of thing. So. Some other things we see in individuals with Down syndrome is often an adherence to routine. They prefer sameness and predictability. The idea that 
uh, with the doctor's care, we weaned him off of meds. That we got him into a, an exercise routine where he um, walks around the neighborhood unassisted, voluntarily, twice a day, and is losing weight. Getting down to his ideal weight is uh, very gratifying that these things are being accomplished in this last year. Over the last year, I've looked for many ways to try to empower Andy with mm -hmm. what comes natural to him and what his autism almost dictates that he does. So for example, Andy loves routines. Loves routines. So whatever he does is what he wants to keep doing in the future. Mm -hmm. So I, I saw him moving here as an opportunity to change what he does on a daily basis. And as long as I found consistency or yeah. things that work with those things, they would just get projected into the future and those routines would, would carry on for forever. Mm -hmm. And I have this analogy of, of working with Andy is like working with wet cement where you're going to shape it, but it's going to harden. And once it's hardened, you're set. Mm -hmm. And so you can make a routine be a bad thing or a good thing. You know, let's mm -hmm. say a lot of pops every day or a lot of junk food every day. Mm -hmm. Well, that's something Andy is going to do and then want to keep doing. But if you switch out those pops for sparkling water, you know, that becomes his new routine and his new normal. And right. So I've tried to carry that mindset on with everything I've done. Mm -hmm. And we knew that right when he moved in. I think we both had that plan that right when he moves in, we need to start these new routines. We need to get him established and reoriented around how this family is going to operate mm -hmm. with him in it. So visual supports work really well as a way to communicate things. It helps their understanding when visuals are accompanied with words or directions. One of the first things I did, just so Andy could visually see and be reminded that he was going to have to do more stuff now, was I made that Andy's Choice oh, poster. Yes. Still there. <laughs> just to get him in the mindset of, I have to do things that are different. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. walking my parents' dog, mowing the lawn, biking to the library, going yes. on walks around our subdivision, walking to the Dollar General mm -hmm. in town. But we just started to tie those activities to certain incentives. So if you want to pop each day, you got to do just one activity to get that pop, mm -hmm. just to start breaking down the barrier of being able to do new things. And that worked out really well. It did. It made sense to him. He, at some points, he would even bring me the, the cards that he chose. Not a lot, but he did do it a couple times, and that was a big win. Pop, please. So we just started to have him to do different things, and he, he would do them. Routine can actually be a very powerful tool in helping students deal with the uncertainty that's inevitable in their day. Like we mentioned, individuals with autism and Down syndrome like routine and sameness, which can bring them comfort and keep them well regulated. It can also be a great way for us to build in flexibility, taking them through changes they'll come to understand ahead of time. That things can be the same, but different, and that's okay. Scheduling everything that he does, all the routines that we've started to do over the last year, Having those be on his iPad with reminders and mm -hmm. times associated with has been almost the biggest positive change we've seen Easily. since having Andy Easily. because it just works. He listens to his calendar, maybe because it's not somebody telling him what to do, even though it is, but his iPad is kind of a, a special thing for him. So he wants mm -hmm. to work with it. He doesn't have any resistance to the things that pop up on his iPad. It's very much a positive experience. So now, his teeth brushing is calendarized, and he does it on the dot. And be 8.30 before, p.m. Yeah, 8.30 p.m. You door, hear that door opens, open. you hear the brushing. <laughs> brushing. <laughs> but before, I mean, when I was visiting your house in Minnesota and stuff, I would see many times where just getting him to brush teeth was a huge conflict, a daily conflict where mm -hmm. he'd get extremely mad at you know, his parents or whoever told him to brush his teeth, mm -hmm. very upset. And I do think that that has to do a bit with his independence, right? Yeah. Where if someone is telling him to do something, he experiences that resistance. But having it be from his iPad, which he loves and enjoys, it, it feels a bit more independent. He's an adult. He can do it himself. He's going to listen to the calendar and he's going to brush his teeth. Giving them clear visual expectations of what they're going to do, how many they need to do, when they will be done, and what is next. This helps with independence, compliance because they know exactly what they need to do, which reduces anxiety and allows for the student to experience accomplishment, which can be especially important in academics and teaching other new skills. All of his loops each day, 
He does mm -hmm. four loops around the subdivision every day, two in the morning, two in the afternoon. That's calendarized. And as soon as the alert pops up, he's doing it. Mm -hmm. we, we are also scheduling YMCA on the calendar now. We're starting to lift weights, FaceTiming with his parents. I just put that in this week, so we'll see how that goes. But he's never been one to actively reach out from what he's doing to contact his parents. And a lot of times if his parents FaceTime him, he just declines because he's watching something and he's busy. But now when I went in, into his room, I asked him, I said, Andy, I'm, I'm going to add a new thing to your calendar about FaceTiming your parents. Do you want it on Tuesdays or do you want it on Thursdays? And he said, both, mm -hmm. which surprised me. And it, it tells me, okay, this guy does miss his parents, but he just doesn't always know how to connect his feeling with actions in life. But once the calendar is there, it bridges that. So we put it on for two times a week where he, he will FaceTime. He will initiate a FaceTime with his parents mm -hmm. because he does miss them. Mm -hmm. Hey, Andy. Quick question for you. Remember how we were talking the other day about glasses, your glasses and your walks? Let me see if I understand correctly. You were telling me that you don't like to wear your glasses on walks, right? Mm -hmm. And it's because you saw a Penske truck? Mm-hmm. And it made you miss your dad? Mm -hmm. So you don't want to wear glasses because you don't want to see any more Penske trucks? Mm -hmm. Because it makes you miss him? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, Andy. And, and I think, Andy, you know, we will always be his parents. Megan will always be his sister. But you are a friend that he really has never had and somebody that, um, you know, will respond, he will respond to you in a way that, um, is is just fun to see the hey dude let's go play some video games hey let's go for a ride hey let's go to the y he just uh responds to you in a way that's that's unique and special i also would explain to him that hey we're doing this because we're helping you lose weight mm -hmm. and he seemed to genuinely want to lose weight mm -hmm. he never pushed back on that idea at all and as the pounds started to drop he seemed to be happy about that Mm -hmm. And we started to have moments where the weight would kind of stall, you'd hit a plateau. So I'm like, okay, how do I get this guy to run? So we had him run up the hill, the small hill. Yes. And he actually did it. He did. And then there were a few times where I saw he was running up the hill all by himself with no prompt from me. Mm -hmm. So when I say I think he wanted to lose weight, these are some of the reasons why I, I do think he wanted to actually lose weight and he understood the concepts of what mm -hmm. we were doing. It's exceeded my wildest expectations. Just the fact that he's lost 40 pounds, that he, you know, initially exercised with your urging, but now does it by a reminder on his iPad, and that you have caught him not only doing the loop around the neighborhood, but actually running up the hill on his own, that you've caught him in doing weightlifting on his own, not just at your urging that he willingly goes with you to the why, all of those kinds of things are just, um, yeah, beyond my expectation. And Another thing that you started doing with Andy was incorporating biking into his routine. You would bike to the library or bike to the subway, which is right in town. How convenient that he loves subway and that he can bike with you to mm -hmm. subway to get his favorite sub. He likes biking. Loves it. He actually has a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple times he would try to race me or beat me somewhere. <laughs> uh, so it was really neat to see Oh, okay, so there are physical activities that he likes to do. Mm -hmm. He's just resistant to doing them because he's kind of stopped doing them in life. Mm -hmm. And so to pick those things back up again, kind of almost to have him remember what it was like to be a child again, but as an adult, that was kind of the vibe of what seemed to be happening with Andy. It was like a reawakening of a lot of the things I think you remember that just kind of went by the way wayside as adulthood popped up. There are also higher levels of sleep troubles. In addition to sleep apnea we often see in Down syndrome, they could have other things like delayed sleep onset, restlessness, night awakenings, or early awakenings. When he first moved here, he would nap every day. Easily, just, in the He afternoon. would just fall asleep. If Even said, right after breakfast, right, he'd fall asleep. He would fall asleep after breakfast, yeah. <laughs> and now with the exercise and without being on meds anymore, he doesn't really seem to take that many naps anymore. And he seems to have a normal sleep schedule. You might also see other behaviors like throwing certain objects, 
repetitive body movements, like rocking back and forth, flapping, and the need to move their body in order to regulate. So for example, Andy would play with pop tabs for hours on hand. He would start rocking oh a lot when right. he's processing things. Yeah, Pick he'd do this hair. picking of mm -hmm. dandruff. He'd have these things that he would do and he would just do them. And if you look it up, I mean, these are very common types of things that are manifested due to his disabilities. It's mm -hmm. how they process the world. It's how they feel better deal with anxiety right. or uncertainty. And I've noticed after the exercise and the calendar routine that we've gotten established that those behaviors don't, I mean, they happen, but they don't happen in anywhere near the frequency that they used to. Right. I can't remember the last time he's done pop tabs. I can't remember the last time I've seen him rocking for a long time. Mm -hmm. When he scratches his head now, it's nowhere near what he used to do. Mm -hmm. It was obsessive before. Right. And now it's not. Nobody would think anything of it when he's doing it. So I'm actually seeing some of his behaviors attributed to autism change. And it seems to be that those are reactions to anxiety or stress or confusion of the world. And I think now that we've kind of figured out Andy and set him up for his own independent success, that we're seeing actual behavior changes that I mm -hmm. was never expecting to see, mm -hmm. never. It's very rewarding. When you moved to Wisconsin and wondered, oh, what am I going to do? How is it going to work out? What's my plan B going to be? Um, you know, I, I started praying that something would work out and started praying, had my Bible study ladies praying about it. But um, now I see that God had a plan. I just had to wait on his timing. And I do think this is where God wants Andy to be. And, and this is God's plan. And it is... It, I just had to wait on his timing, and it has worked out beyond my <laughs> beyond my wildest expectations. Yeah. I agree. Um, I have a peace with it. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a peace with it, and Andy has peace with where he's living. Too. I eat them. <laughs> Here comes Andy. Hey, nice dude. Ha ha ha.